Bureaucracy of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections, and uh, my colleague uh, Howard Engel is going to be doing the acknowledgement. So, Howard, if you can come up. Sure. Tansi, Buju, Amin, hello and welcome. We are gathered here on, <laughs> it's not that cold in here. We are gathered here on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Oji Cree peoples, and the um, traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. As a member of the uh, settler community, I acknowledge the wrongs of the past, and I pledge myself to engage with my Indigenous brothers and sisters to help to right those wrongs in a spirit of truth and reconciliation because we are all treaty people. Thank you, Howard. Um, so uh, I'd like to, in, uh, to introduce our first speaker who has told me to not read off the program which you uh, have all gotten, but to say that he is one of the most handsome people of <laughs> literary... Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that? You oh. totally were. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, he's just a he's just a charismatic devil, and um, and he is going to be speaking intimately about his father, uh, which I think will be quite uh, insightful for us, uh, those of us who are. Continue, continue. <laughs> those who are uh, who are familiar with uh, Marshall McLuhan's works, I think, will uh, find a lot in here to think about. Okay. Gee, Shelley, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, I, I like to see people a bit pre-programmed, you know. So if you say somebody's really gorgeous, beautiful, kind-hearted, that's the first thing you have to debunk. And it can take you forever, a lifetime. It can take you two minutes, you know. So I, I'm, I'm happy to be the most handsome guy you've seen in a long time up here today. And I'm glad to see so many people. So Are you suggesting I should raise the mic, perhaps? Yes, I'm just wondering that a if suggestion? people could uh, yeah, raise the mic, and then let's just see. I know you. You should come sit near the front so you can hear. <laughs> so tell, tell us when it's OK. I keep going. Um, is that OK? Are we all all right now? Rosanna, you missed the part where I'm the most handsome guy she's ever seen. So uh, I'm so happy to see you guys here. And I thought that was a wonderful land acknowledgement. And I want to say that uh, we come here uh, from our home on native land on the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation's territory over in Georgian Bay. And we're so privileged to live in places uh, where so much incredible beauty and incredible life comes to us through this. And you know, it's an amazing thing. This is not part of my program, by the way. I'm, I'm just doing this so you can get levels and, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding. But it, it is so amazing to think that um, uh, a mere 6,000 years or so BC, the Great Lakes didn't exist the way they are, you know? And, and, this in, and I know that's an Ontario speak kind of thing, but um, it, it's an amazing thing when we think about uh, coming back to terms with the original inhabitants of the land who were stewards of our land for so many thousands of years before we got here. And there is much to, to get right. And uh, actually, in our territory, we now have a wonderful, uh, and I say this, I guess I'm an ally. Uh, we have a, a wonderful land claim happening on the Bruce Peninsula to try and right the wrongs where uh, virtually the entire peninsula was ripped off, you know, and uh, coerced. They lied, they cheated, they stole. And uh, it's not a, a very proud history to be of. So I'm going to embark now with your permission on a few of those people that were probably, although not direct architects of that. Um, when, when I think back uh, to the people that came here before that are European heritage, uh, we were fairly callous and um, the doctrine of discovery really ensured 
that we did not grant humanity to the first peoples that were here. And um, I'm sure that the people uh, that were our progenitors here on the land were equally guilty of that. And we're going to make that right, aren't we? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So now I'll give my program. Um, this program's called Some Things My Father Told Me. And um, I'm going to get out my glasses because that's about the only part of this I remember. <laughs> and I, I hope you haven't come here uh, for a secret key to understanding my father's work. Um, you know, there's so much in academia that depends on my not revealing anything like that. So I, I, I don't want to do it. It would be so much poor if such a thing were even possible. Today, I merely want to give you a small sense of who the man was, a bit about his roots, where he came from, and possibly what made him tick. Because I've been to many conferences on McLuhan, and this is a symposium, not a conference, where so much is said about his work. I'm really not going to tell you anything about his work. There are some fabulous books. And um, at this point, I'll actually direct you. If you're not familiar, anybody here not familiar to Marshall's work? Well, I'm not going to even direct you to those books then. You can ask me later if you were just too shy. Dad always started his talks with a joke or two. And in keeping with that sentiment, I'll apologize in advance, and here's my offering. So finishing up his questions on a job interview, the interviewer asks, so tell me a little bit about yourself. The applicant responds, I'd really rather not. I kind of want this job. <laughs> I'm the son of a famous guy. And I'm sure that the other progeny of famous parents have had life experiences similar to my own. In the 60s, when perfect strangers learned my surname, they would frequently ask, and I mean always ask, McLuhan, really? Are you any relation to? And they'd never finish the sentence. You know, so I used to sort of stand around and stare for a while and sit, just see, are these people actually going to finish it? And then I'd say, yeah, he's my father. First reaction, oh, go on, I don't believe you. My reaction in those days would be less polite than they would be today. But after we got over that, if they did believe me, they would say, so what's it like being the son of such a famous guy, such a famous father? Now, this was in the States. Uh, we were blessed living in Canada because Canada never recognizes its own anywhere near as rapidly as you get this fame all over the world. So uh, we had that refuge. And one of the reasons why Dad really loved it at St. Mike's College in uh, U of T is he didn't have to deal with that constant barrage, the constant demands that came from the States. So it's 50 years later. And my dad died almost 40 years ago. Once every few weeks, I still get those same questions and the same reactions. In my mind, what I've just described perfectly encapsulates what it's like having a famous father. That and the fact that a day rarely passes that I do not hear or read his name mentioned in the media. And at this point, I have to say, both my wife and myself, we listen and read the CBC, and that might account for a bit of that. But two or three times a day, Marshall McLuhan is mentioned. It's really extraordinary, too, in books. We read a lot of books. And his name comes up all the time in books in reference. You know, oh, Marshall McLuhan would do this, or whatever. A novel doesn't matter. I read a biography of Bill Graham about a few months ago. And he's even in there in the formation of the, uh, uh, the, the, the players the, before he did the band stuff. The Mind Troop, San Francisco Mind Troop. Peter Coyote, who is an actor down the States, uh, said he got his job with the Mind Troop because he was going out with my sister at the time. And that's a true story. <laughs> and we never believed Mary, but there, there it is in print in, in Bill Graham's biography. And that's how he got this job, because the guy started talking to him about Marshall McLuhan in the interview. So it, it's, it's kind of hard to sort of uh, explain to people what it's like to be the son of a guy like that. Today, there are academic halls, meeting and seminar rooms, and even a building named in his honor. And lest I forget, there is also Marshall McLuhan High School in Toronto, 
And uh, it's huge, 1,800 students, I find that huge. Um, part of St. Joseph Street in Toronto is called Marshall McLuhan Way. And in Berlin, the Canadian Embassy has a Marshall McLuhan Salon open to the public. His work is subject of many undergrad and graduate courses all over the world. There's a Marshall McLuhan Fellowship Award granted yearly in the Philippines, sponsored by the Canadian Embassy there. And it is granted to a cutting edge journalist in the Philippines. My father's work is integral to the first two years of a journalism degree in the Philippines. And I, all the years I've been doing this, I've been executor since 2008 and got drafted into this job. All the years that I've been doing this, I've never run into anyone at a media ecology conference or elsewhere that hasn't been surprised that dad forms the foundation of journalism school in the Philippines. So what you find out is when he's translated into a few dozen languages, when there are zillions of books all over the world, each culture takes from that work what they want. And you have to be really open to it. So that's yet another thing. Today I'm going to share with you some personal family anecdotes, my own impressions, and some, some from my uh, siblings. So, how was a guy who was born in Edmonton in 1911, was brought up in Winnipeg from 1915, collected baseball cards, had a paper route, became an Eagle Scout, and later a poetry scholar at Cambridge University in England, how did he come to be known as the Oracle of the Electronic Age? Adorning the pages of Life magazine, being on the cover of Newsweek, Look magazine, and so many others. Um, to start with, he was a very perceptive fella. He was able to perceive patterns and associations with very disparate sources. I'm, I'm advancing slides a little prematurely there, so I'm just going to go back here. Oh boy, there he is. That's our kid that collected baseball cards. I hit a button. I, I'm, you know, this is one of those laptop thingies, and it's got those buttons there, so I'll just try and stand over to this side. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. I don't want to mess up my presentation. I worked hours on this. Um, and, and you know, he, uh, he was able to pull, out of very vast readings, he was able to pull uh, associations from very disparate sources. He described himself as a Renaissance man, which I believe he used as a euphemism for the kind of scholarship that was not contained or constrained or siloed in any particular field. The kind of scholarship which embraced all fields of endeavor as a great whole. He felt it was after the Renaissance that international renown as a founder, sorry, he felt that it was after the Renaissance that specialization came into vogue. And indeed, a poetry scholar who came to international renown as a founder of the field of media studies and research, he published dozens of books translated into a plethora of languages and has had many more published about him. Yes, he was a Renaissance man. And now that's just one of the things my father told me. I'm only telling you the stuff that really stood out to me while I was writing this. Now, we get to this one. I live with that. Um, he did say that. Uh, I believe I was in grade four at the time. I came into the living room. Dad's lying on the couch, reading, of course, stubby beer in hand, stubby cigar in the ashtray. Michael Mayboy. What did you learn in school today? He feigned interest occasionally, you know. Well, we learned that in Brazil, they're developing a new capital in the jungle called Brasilia to open up and develop the interior of the country. By the way, I'm very old. <laughs> the capital of Brazil is Rio de Janeiro. No, really, they've just moved the capital to Brasilia. The capital of Brazil is Rio de Janeiro. Studious boy gets Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica from the shelf and shows Brasilia to be the new capital, feeling victorious. The capital of Brazil is Rio de Janeiro. The encyclopedia is wrong. <laughs> and he didn't say it with rancor. You know, he just knew he was right. So that was one thing I must communicate, uh, that when you were living with my father, you had to sort of give up on, on, on trying to sell him on any kind of newfangled ideas if he was set in his ways there. Many of his better known aphorisms emerged at the dinner table. This takes us back to the 50s. 
Before Visa and MasterCard, there were Diners Club and American Express. Credit cards were mystifying things. They were new things. None of you look old enough to realize that there was a time before Visa and MasterCard. They were the province of only the wealthiest. It was in the 50s, and I remember him laughing as he described the idea of them. And he said, money, it's going to become the poor man's credit card. And you see, that's true. And that's where that particular saying came from. He's, that's one of his more famous things that he said as well. So we're going to get into this, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about where, uh, how he was brought up. And uh, that's kind of interesting, anyhow. Oddly, I'm only among the fourth generation of McLuhan since my great-grandfather, James Hilliard McLuhan, who was born in 1838, and that's the guy sitting there, uh, emigrated here in 1846 or 7. His dad, William, was born in 1801, and the following is from a family history. At the time of their wedding, William McLuhan was a resident of Dromore, and Mary Bradshaw was a resident of Hillsborough. Now, that's a shot of my great-great-grandmother from 1876, I do believe. A real party animal, you can tell. <laughs> I kind of, at first I thought she looked a lot like uh, Mammy Yoakum in Al Cap's old uh, strip. <laughs> Mary Bradshaw was a resident of Hillsborough. Mary Bradshaw had a much older brother named James Bradshaw, who had a son named James Bradshaw, who was born in 1808 in County Down. William McLuhan became good friends with this nephew of Mary's. And according to family lore, I did say that this is from our, uh, our, our family history, by the way, I didn't write this. According to family lore, these two were good friends of Charlie Barleycorn. They loved to spend money. As a consequence, their family sent them to Canada in order to straighten them out. <laughs> now, I, I trust you all uh, can piece together who Charlie Barleycorn was. There was a great song by Traffic. I would only have known because of the song by Traffic called uh, John Barleycorn back in the 60s. There you go. Oh, yeah. Well, Charlie Barleycorn was the earlier version. Must have been his father. <laughs> it came to pass that the two young men and their wives landed in Montreal in 1846 or 47. Also, according to family lore, while coming over on the boat, William simplified the spelling of the family name by changing it from, I'm not even going to say this, M-C-C-L-O-U-G-H-A-N to McLuhan, M-C-L-U-H-A-N. Now, I end the, uh, the quote from the family history and say, that's why I believe we are all related. All, of, all the McLuhans in North America are related because it was my great, great grandfather who changed the spelling of the name. And I, I also find it kind of remarkable that at the spry young age of 67, I'm the fourth generation over here since 1846. So I think we all get to things a little bit later in life. Or maybe we're just, I'm the baby of the family. Maybe we're all babies of the family on that, on that side. So the basic sentiment here is that old William was a bit of a party animal problem, so they kicked him out. James was known to be a lover of dance and music. Although his wife, Margaret Grieve, was a fairly straight, upright, church-going sort. She looks very much the party animal herself, too, of course. Their son, my grandfather, Herbert Ernest McLuhan, born in 1879, was a combination of the two, and he loved to tell stories, play the fiddle, but he was religiously bent. Henry Selden Hall was born in 1861, and that's the guy on the, uh, just getting my directions right, on the far right. And um, he's my grandmother, Elsie's dad, and Elsie is standing in the background. My great-grandfather. Family lore has it that he was a hard man. When his sons went off to fight in the Great War, he sought to enlist because he didn't want to send his sons overseas alone. And he was 57 at the time. So he was rejected because he was too old. He waited a bit, lied about his age, and went overseas. He was nothing if not tight. Three generations earlier, before, 1790, John Hall married Nancy Monroe and emigrated to Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia from Bristol. 
His kid, Henry, married Seraphina Brown, and their kid, John Henry, married Naomi Ogilvie. And they are in the upper corner there. And um, my grandmother's name was Elsie Naomi Hall. It's amazing when you start exploring these and you find out to where all these uh, things come from. The Halls were a very different family from the McLuhans. My grandmother, Elsie Naomi, was what you might call severe. <laughs> She was very unlike my jovial, easygoing grandfather, Herbert Ernest. This is her wedding picture from uh, New Year's Day in 1909. I only knew her after a stroke when she was hospitalized, which added to her severe demeanor. My sister Liz, however, says she was a mentor, a creative sort, a very different impression. Although she was 10 years younger than her husband, she passed away six or seven years before him. Now, Elsie was a dramatic performer. And this brochure, actually, you can see her business card. I will set up Gertrude Avenue. <laughs> this is the earliest brochure I have of her and her work. She was a dramatic performer and elocutionist formally trained who performed all over the country. As the two boys grew, she spent more and more time on the road. Herbert was a very willing, almost single parent. When she was home, apparently things got rocky. She did not hold Herbert in very high regard, and today they would have probably divorced. For the record, the house they occupied the longest was 507 Gertrude. When I was young, I loved my grandfather's stories and his tales and his fiddle playing. He, he was just an endless fount of entertainment. He was a character. Unfortunately, by the time we were buds, he was getting what we called senile at the time. This was in the early 60s. He probably had Alzheimer's. He was in his late 80s, but great fun in spite of all that. Now, my father's brother, Morris, known as Uncle Red in the family, uh, he had red hair, for those of you that can't. He wasn't a communist. <laughs> he became a United Church minister. He was also a superb entertainer, great piano player, and a jokester. Although Dad loved to share jokes and was a constant punster, he had no musicality. It was just awful. He had an insane recall of most of what he read, and he read a lot. He had huge volumes of poetry committed to memory. Even when he was disabled by a stroke, he could blurt out Shakespeare. It was quite astounding, actually. He'd be sitting beside him in a car discussing. Actually, I drove him down to, uh, to Stratford with a friend of mine to uh, see Peter Ustinov as King Lear. And I couldn't remember the daughter's names. And I had one of them. And from beside me, amidst a spray of saliva, came out, Reagan! Goneril! <laughs> You know, he was so impatient, and he, he couldn't say anything at that time except bum 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 So it was quite astounding, you know, it, it, and it's amazing. Being a face, uh, a lot of the caregivers at the time sort of assumed, you know, he was a bit of a vegetable. I'm, I'm going to tell you another story. This is completely anecdotal to that and off the topic of this. He was trying to communicate to me something I had no idea what it was, and he was getting very frustrated. So he took me by the sleeve and dragged me upstairs to the third floor to where his library was. He walked over, pulled a blue book, thousands of books, by the way, thousands of books. This is not five, not a hundred, not a bookcase, the whole room. He walked over, pulls a blue book off the shelf, opens it up, thumbs through a few pages, and starts pointing with his finger, jabbering. He wanted to talk about the sinking of the Lusitania. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, I, I don't believe it when people say that people with strokes are not really cognizant. Of course they are. Back to my script. He had insane recall of most of what he read, and he read a lot. He had huge volumes of poetry committed to memory. Oh, yes, and then he blurted out Shakespeare, so I'm ahead of that. I think it's pretty easy to see that he took after his mum while Red took after his dad. My grandmother's family started every day on the farm kneeling in prayer in the kitchen. In our family, we ended up say, ended the day saying the rosary kneeling around mom and dad's bed. Now, dad converted to Catholicism at Cambridge uh, in the 30s under the influence of author G.K. Chesterton. And he once jokingly remarked that you either became a Catholic or a communist in Cambridge uh, uh, prior to the Second World War. At least I think he was joking. 
You can never be sure. There might have been some veracity. Some of our finest spies came out of Cambridge as well. I, I mean for the other side, by the way, yes. The McLuhan side also had itinerant Methodist ministers riding from pastoral charge to pastoral charge in their numbers. The halls were fire and brimstone Baptists. I can imagine that this was yet another source of conflict in the home. My father moved with his parents to Winnipeg in 1915. He attended Gladstone School, Earl Grey School, Calvin Technical High School, before enrolling in the University of Manitoba in 1928. He received a BA Honours in 33 and MA in 34 before going on to study at the University of Cambridge. He had a great friend here named uh, Tom Easterbrook that, that used to come around the house in the city uh, in Toronto. And uh, he and Tom uh, had told me that they worked their way across to Britain on a cattle boat. They didn't have any money. They were poor students and living on next to nothing. Rode bicycles in England all over. And if you knew my father, you couldn't imagine him on a bicycle. At Cambridge, he received another BA and MA, and then he received his PhD. I think he inherited this drive from the Hall side. Dad was enthralled with what he referred to as great minds, great men. There were very few women on the list, unless they were saints, who changed the course of humanity through their writings. He loved the lack of specialization of these towering intellects. And when I asked him why he would do all that work to get a second BA and MA, he told me he felt his Cambridge education was more thorough and better, perhaps superior. I believe that the more likely reason was that Cambridge might have had that as a requirement. Not sure. Uh, at this point, I do want to mention um, this photo at the lower right was done in 1935 in Cambridge and was the photo that we sent uh, to the sculptor, Madeline. Where's Madeline again? Oh, hi, Madeline. Brilliant job she did on the sculpture, which you'll see. But she basically worked with that shot of dad. We were trying to get something that was in between adulthood and being a child here in uh, Winnipeg. Such a dashing looking fella. So for fun, and he always only told, retold stories of great fun. He said he and Red would build watercraft of various sorts. I have photos of various raft-like objects. He told me they built rowboats and sailboats, although no photos of home-built rowboats or sailboats from this period have survived. I think he rather aggrandized the craft in his uh, mind. You know, after uh, maybe in his memory they became somewhat more grand. When he was at St. Mike's in Toronto from 1946 onward, he had a sailboat which he kept down at the harbor. Early in the 50s, he capsized it with my sister Terry and brother Eric in it. This marked the end of his sailing days. He loved regaling me with Tom Sawyer type adventure stories of sailing or rowing on one of the two rivers he lived here in Quebec, or in Winnipeg. <laughs> Not in Quebec. And you know, it, it's interesting because he told me, I, I had a hard time visualizing this. He said he lived on the street and there was a river at one end and a river at the other. And so he'd go back and forth. And I come here and, my God, whoever founded the city did put his house right in the middle between two rivers. So that part is believable. Um, I think if you look at the craft, yes, he likely left them without fear of having them stolen on the shore of each one of the rivers. Uh, this is my mother there in the middle. Somebody had asked me, are, are you going to have your mother in this? And I said, well, no, not really, except incidentally, this is about dad in Winnipeg. But uh, she also seemed to have fun sailing. And I managed to find a shot of Terry and Eric in, uh, in the sailboat in the harbor. So it wasn't a really grand craft, but uh, it was tippable. So it fortunately kept him out of the water, eh? <laughs> I found it funny. Okay. He also loved rowing. I'm going to show you another slide. And um, he was on the Cambridge rowing team in 1936, and his oar was number three. It hung in his office and then in our living room for decades. They numbered them by your position in the scalp. He was also at Trinity College at Cambridge. We will note the recurrence of the number three. And we will remember that he was a Catholic convert. Number three was his favorite number because of the Holy Trinity. Of course. Here I should mention that my brother, Thomas Eric Marshall, was named after Thomas Aquinas. 
And um, my parents were fond of saying they wanted two boys and stopped after uh, I was born. I have four sisters. They're sandwiched in the middle. Poor them. Um, I was named after uh, Michael the Archangel, Lord of the Way. I can't help but feel that I might have betrayed his expectations somewhat. But I'm really glad. He also loved St. Augustine. I'm really glad he didn't call me Augustine. <laughs> what would that have been? Augie? Augie McLuhan? Hey, Augie! Want a nickel sandwich? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dad went to Mass almost daily at St. Basil's Church near his office. When it came to his faith, he never questioned. It grounded him. I think it enabled him to let his intellect range freely through the chaos he envisaged coming as we transitioned from a literate society to a more oral tribal society. He saw the global village as a place of lost individual identity and concomitant rise in internecine violence. Privacy would also be obliterated as everyone in a village knows everyone else's business, as he'd say. And he found that heinous, you know, in the age of Facebook. He wouldn't have liked that, no. In the 60s, of course, we all thought this heralded a new era of one world, one mind, peace, love, and groovy. For him, it foreshadowed instead the Balkans, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Syria. Now, from an article in Wired in 1996, I really like this synopsis, so I'm going to briefly read from it. Oh, by, way, by the way, uh, this historical plaque went up outside his office on 96 St. Joe Street, otherwise known as Marshall McLuhan Way in Toronto. And so that's sort of another thing that it's like having him as your father. You keep bumping into these monuments. McLuhan did not want to live in the global village. The prospect frightened him. Print culture had produced a rational man in whom vision was the dominant sense. Print man lived in a world that was secular rather than sacred, specialized rather than holistic. But when information travels at electronic speeds, the linear clarity of, print, of the print age is replaced by a feeling of all at onceness, simultaneity. Everything everywhere happens simultaneously. There is no clear order or sequence. The sudden collapse of space into a single unified field, quotes, dethrones the visual sense. This is what the global village means. We are all within range of a single voice or the sound of the tribal drums. For McLuhan, this future held a profound risk of mass, ter mass terror and sudden panic. The current idea of the global village as a place of universal harmony and industrious basket weaving is a tourist fantasy. And Dad would have agreed 100% with this. On his birthday in 1969, we were gathered around the television watching the lunar landing. He was born on July 21st. I think the landing came on the 20th, so it would have actually been the taking off. It was quite a spectacular event, piloting a craft that looked like a tinfoil creation from Plan 9 from outer space. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong did the unthinkable. They walked on the moon, and JFK's vision was finally a, a reality. And as I recall another sentiment, we were finally beating the Russians. Dad turned to me awestruck, and he said, I grew up with a horse and buggy. Then there was a motor car, aeroplane, and he said aeroplane, you know, as people used to say, jets. Now we have taken a rocket to the moon. There will never be another life like mine. Now this is the final thing my father told me that I'm going to share with you today. There was humility in his demeanor that day. My memories of my father and family are rich and deep, and also a bit non-sequential. So, what was it like being his son? I met John and Yoko. I did. I spent about 45 minutes with him alone with my sister Liz while they were getting ready for this TV set downstairs. I talked to John. <laughs> Yoko was there. <laughs> I had lunch with Pierre Trudeau when he was cool at the Chateau Laurier and dinner with Duke Ellington, who was always cool, at the Royal York. I was on a cruise ship in the Aegean in the early 70s with Margaret Mead and uh, Bucky Fuller. And I listened as Arnold Toynbee, whom I loved, tied in Greek democracy with the Indian caste system and English public schools while sitting on a hill across from the Acropolis. 
None of these things would have happened had I not been Marshall McLuhan's son. So in a circuitous way, I hope I've answered that question which people have asked me so many decades and you guys are the first people I've asked, answered that question for. Because <laughs> who the hell wants to talk to somebody who says, what's it like being Marshall McLuhan's son? So don't ask me that, by the way, afterwards, thank you. Um, <laughs> frankly, although I've known no other life, uh, it was a pretty damn special life. This image was taken, whoopsie daisy, there. This image was taken in August 1967 on Center Island in Toronto. And somehow the Toronto Telegram <laughs> convinced everybody to do this. Dad liked to hang with people who were not afraid to think and who were not afraid to challenge orthodoxies. He was also not afraid to be wrong, although he did not often admit it. And that was part of his magic and his strength. Well, I mentioned Dad was hired by uh, St. Michael's College as a poetry scholar. He saw so much more than the average reader, no? <laughs> almost every page is annotated. Almost every one of the thousands of books that he owned were also annotated. His library is collected in the Thomas Fisher Rear Book Room at the University of Toronto, and together with the Public Archives Canada, which is a repository of Dad's papers, letters, and manuscripts, UNESCO has recognized the combined collections in their memory of the world designation. So that's a pretty big thing as I found out. There's very few of those and only very few in Canada. Ah, and uh, also, I'm serious. If he did borrow a book from you, it came back destroyed. I mean, you know, in future generations, they said, oh my God, Marshall McClure wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we will continue. This is Rene Serra, and uh, with my mom and dad. My mom's the woman in there. Uh, a student of contemporary, uh, contemporary of dad's, Elizabeth Trott, was my godmother, and she was here in approximately 1935. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, she actually told me, she, she passed away in the mid-90s. Uh, actually, I'll get right into this because it's a more intimate family story for me. My daughter, uh, Gwendolyn, was born on the weekend that Renee passed away. And um, her middle name is Renee, with another E. And Renee uh, had told me that when he was injured in the First World War with a grenade, he got a job as studio assistant to Henri Matisse. Um, and he was trained in architecture and ended up designing uh, store windows for Eaton's College Street, but he always painted. He was a phenomenal painter. He painted with a stick. Um, and um, my godmother told me, because I, I asked her, she was a journalist and an artist, and I asked her, how did you know Dad? And she said, everybody knew your dad. <laughs> he was a star. And that was in 1935. So I go back to the beginning and, and Shelley's very gracious uh, introduction of how beautiful I am. And um, I have to say, gosh, I got it all from him, Shell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Elizabeth Trott was my godmother and she was an artist and journalist. She either introduced Renee to my parents or was introduced to Renee by my parents in the late 40s. That was before my time. She later married Renee and there's a painting of his which she donated to the University of Manitoba here in memory of Pank, or Frank uh, Pickerskill, who died in 1944, born in 1915, so he would have been contemporary of uh, Liz Trotz. Frank died at the hands of the Nazis near the end of the war in a prison camp. Both Rene and Liz were extremely close friends of the family, and you can see uh, this painting. I'm sure Shelley will tell us where it is. Um, when U of T, uh, created a home for Dad's center, Renee painted this 12 by 8 foot triptych to be the centerpiece of the meeting area. And it now hangs in Brennan Hall at St. Michael's College. So, so many, so many good things had their genesis here in Winnipeg. I'm tying it all in. Renee also painted with a stick. I, you know, he was married to my godmother. I got to talk to, about him a bit. And uh, he never used a brush or rarely used a brush in the time that I knew of. And one last funny um, uh, anecdote, he was quite deaf and uh, in his 96th year I think I was visiting them down in Lenox, Massachusetts where he lived and um, I'll, I'll cut about where what it was and I'm going to move back from the microphone because when he wanted to call uh, Liz he couldn't move uh, out of a wheelchair kind of thing um, he would go, darling 
And then he turns to me and he says, oh, I've been married three times. I can never remember two names. He was a really loving guy, though. It was, uh, believe me. And he had this really charming French accent. Whenever you went out to the restaurant, he called the chef out and gave him the order, like straight out. It was really quite impressive. OK, <laughs> back to the story. In our family growing up, there was lots of chaos. Dad was away more often than not. Six kids ensured a constant, lively environment, as I remember it. We were always encouraged in our pursuits. They did not have to be practical. We were surrounded by literally thousands of books and encouraged to read to find answers for ourselves. We were encouraged to be creative, and we constantly intersected with creative people. Now, I told somebody a little earlier that I was going to have a picture of my nephew, Andrew, here. Who was it? Was it no, who was it? Who's the friend of Andrew's? Oh, there we are. Uh, he's the little fella in his arms on the, on the far left there. Uh, that's my nephew, Andrew. And uh, gosh, they're cute, those kids. Those are my brother's kids. So in, in the other picture, Betty uh, Sira uh, took that picture. And that's got all my siblings. There are very few pictures with all of us in the same picture. And you can see my brother, who became my hero at this time, for a couple of reasons. First, he left home, and I got his record collection. <laughs> um, and he was 17 when he joined the uh, USAF in Great Falls, Montana. And he gave me this fabulous key ring with a male fist for the Strategic Air Command. It was wonderful. I'm so sorry I lost that. Oh, that's me on the, the lower right. And my sister Lizzie, of course, dad and mom, Stephanie, Terry, Eric, and Mary. As you can see, the girls are very impressed with having to stand around Easter 1962. There you go. I hope today that I've been able to give you a sense of who my father was, his playfulness, his faith, his loyalties. In his professional life, he often found himself a lone voice adrift on a sea of disbelieving academics and fellows. He recharged his batteries at home and in the church. He was a prairie boy, a child of the peg, he really was, who somehow seized his dreams and pursued them relentlessly. He was the most brilliant man that I have ever known, although Arnold Toynbee pulled a close second for me with that speech about tying the caste system and the English public school system together with a Greek democracy movement. He was endlessly inquisitive and able to connect the most disparate bits of information, always coming up with something no one else had been able to voice before. Now, this image on the lower right uh, is important. It, it was taken in uh, late August, early September 1980, just before he died. He was a FASIC there and still able to have a blast. The guy beside him is Ted Carpenter. And Ted Carpenter, um, along with that, they started a publication that started the whole Toronto School. And it was called Explorations in about 1953. And they were friends to the end. That was taken by Audie de Manil, who is uh, Ted's wife. And uh, three months later, Deb was dead uh, from a stroke. Uh, Explorations has recently, amazingly, just been republished by Whip and Stock. And so it's available. If you go online, you can get the first eight issues. They're really great. Oh, obviously, up on the upper right there, one of the most famous <laughs> things. Uh, uh, there was an amazing period in the late 80s where, you know, instead of being known for his writings, when people would come up and ask me those questions, he was known for Annie Hall. I am not kidding. And I'm executor of the estate. I've got to tell you something funny. This is something, I don't know how the motion picture industry works, but I think you've got to get into it. We get quarterly checks for Annie Hall from SAG, the Screen Actors Guild down the States, and they run to about a total of around $320 American a year, he's in it for maybe 90 seconds. It's just astounding. Like, what did we do wrong? We should have learned to act, right? I'm telling you. So I, I put the photo in the middle, even though it's out of focus and terrible, because it's one of the cameras we had around the house, those instamatic things. Because that was dad, that was mom. They had fun, you know? It wasn't always serious. So just to close out now, in January of 1966, a team from Life magazine spent a week following him around. And I'm going to leave you with a few images from their photographer, Henri Domaine. 
If there's time for it, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, that you might have after this. And if I get the boot off stage, then uh, I'll hang around. You can buttonhole me. No problem. And you don't get to leave until I give you something. I got something for you. I, I don't know, you guys, if you know, you guys must know, because she's so famous and in our hearts over in Saugeen, Ojibwe territory there. This is Rosanna Deerchild, who has unreserved on uh, CBC, and she's my Facebook friend. How many people get to meet their Facebook friends? I'm going to meet you, Rosanna. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so we'll get to the slides. I'll dispose of this. Nobody else can have it. Thank you. <laughs> And that really is dead. This is outside his office. Before he had the, uh, uh, the center there, he had this little cubbyhole of an office. And, you know, he didn't give up the office when they gave him uh, uh, the center. He just had another place to put books. So I, I won't read everything, because I think people that put up PowerPoints and then start to read from them, they should all be punched in the head. <laughs> but that is his secretary, Mrs. Stewart. Margaret Stewart, she was just a lifesaver and a wonderful, wonderful person. I have no idea who that cat is. But you know, when you're walking around with Life Magazine for a week, you go where they tell you, you stand where they tell you to, and then they, they do this incredible story. I, I was in grade seven at the time at De La Salle in Toronto, and man, February 25th, this, this magazine came out. Hey, I was somebody, and does, does everybody, here know what Life Magazine is? I mean, I realize that. You, you guys all have gray hair. That doesn't count, you know. Any, anybody else? There is nobody young here, okay. <laughs> so we all know life was cool. It was big. Do you know life? Good. <laughs> you look young. <laughs> this is Harley Parker, and uh, he worked with my dad, authored a couple books with him, and um, uh, w was around the center for years. Um, I was a kid. Uh, during this time. In 66, I think I was 13 or 14. Yeah, I was 13. And uh, Harley was an artist, as you can see, and a painter, and he had painted that picture behind him. And of course, it was just the beginning of the psychedelic area. Th that uh, picture is called Children Flying, and I just thought that was the neatest thing. Boy, oh boy. Psychedelic or what? And that's a typical dad um, uh, pose. I, I used to say what Dad did was he, he sat around pontificating, which would be that he let his mouth run off, and um, he would just come up with all these ideas, and he'd generally be surrounded by a few people that would be listening to him and just marveling at him. Y you can see there's always a mix of art and books. Uh, the art was always personal. Some was actually really valuable, as it turns out. Most of it was real crap and bad posters. But the books were, uh, were all amazing. I love this shot. I, I was 35 years a photographer as a profession, and before that I was a musician, and Henri Domain was one of the greats. Uh, he really was. You won't know his name too well, but when you see his work, uh, you will recognize it. He was wee young when he did this shoot. Pontificating. This would have been at St. Mike's. Uh, the next uh, few are at, oh no, there we are in our kitchen. Um, everybody thought we were really rich because he was so well known. <laughs> I just have to say six kids. <laughs> Anybody under the impression that you're rich, six kids, university professor, you know, didn't happen. That's our cat Fluffy, and that's me holding Fluffy, and my mom at the kitchen. And yes, every night we dressed formally for dinner and hung out with ties and, and served my mom's hair just recently done. Never. And, um, you know, it's an amazing thing what happens. Life Magazine, they come into your life, this is how we are at home. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of fun. That was like home. That was Toronto. It used to get snow. This would have been in January 66. I would have shoveled it. And that was our house. It's now uh, got a plaque out front. Uh, he loved to build a fire. We heat our house with fire, or with wood, rather. <laughs> <laughs> Great deal of fun. I think I got my love of that from him. I wish the brains parted. It sort of rubbed off more. That's my sister, Terry. Terry's name was Teresa until she hit grade nine, and that wasn't cool. It's not so cool being named after St. Teresa of Avila, is it? And that's my mom, of course, and I won't say who the other guy is, but there is a stubby beer there. 
Now, I found this particularly uh, revealing because, again, in 1966, he's obviously giving a seminar or something. Can anybody spot a woman? And it wasn't a seminary. Faculty meeting. Besides the looks of abject boredom, and do we have to put up with a Life magazine guy coming into our faculty meeting? Where are the women? I had to put this one in. Over in the far right, there is a female. I don't know whose secretary she is, but she's there. She's upping the ante. Um, he, he took them over to the ROM, and uh, Harley, Harley Parker used to design um, displays at the ROM as well before he started working for my dad full time. I gotta get my glasses on here because I think Harley's in the shot. Yeah, he's over in the uh, far right there, just looking back. And there's my brother Eric at 24. I always thought uh, he'd have far less hair than me, you know, and um, his hair never changed. He, he had this receding hairline. I thought, yeah, yeah, I got this long hair. You're all ugly and all lost. And here I am, no hair. It's a terrible thing. So uh, I wasn't yet there. Um, this was 1966 January, so w I would have been in grade eight. And this is parent-teacher night at uh, Oakwood Collegiate for my sister Liz. They went everywhere. And it was, oh, just a few months after this, a year and a half after this, that um, I started going out with my wife, Danuta, in, uh, in June 1967. As she was going into Oakwood and I was leaving. So that's how that picture got in. There's Harley and Dad walking around on campus. Now, I'll bet you if you look at Toronto in January, you will not see the snow. So there's something happening, isn't there? Guy was a great photographer. Uh, one of those guys is president of the University, Sirlock, I think his name was. And uh, these two were actually in Life magazine. I think everything else I showed you was an outtake. And um, uh, Dad, Mom, they really did have that kind of relationship. Uh, the painting on the wall behind him there is now in our living room. That's by Harley Parker. And the one behind my head in the picture over the side, unfortunately, I don't own. It's by Wyndham Lewis, and it's worth a quadrillion dollars. Actually, only thirty or 40000 but it's uh, uh, kind of nice to, to see that stuff. So we had this real mix. The, the painting in behind my brother's head is one of my sister that was done in Disneyland. I don't know if it still exists. <laughs> Anyway, folks, um, I really thank you for listening to me, and I hope you have a better sense of who my father was. I hope you have a sense. I know you didn't learn anything about what he did, but, you know, too much of that is divorced from who he was. And he was a really neat guy, my dad. Thank you. explain um, the process, how this all came about. Uh, the Winnipeg Realtors has this program called the Winnipeg Citizens Hall of Fame. Some of you may be familiar with the, uh, their, the installation of bronze busts of uh, notable Winnipeggers over the years at Assiniboine Park. That has uh, currently been um, set aside because of their construction and so on. And that's why Marshall isn't being installed officially yet, but we get to have him here, which is even better, I think. Um, and uh, it took us, meaning Esther and I, uh, three tries <laughs> to persuade the uh, selection committee to, to select uh, Marshall McLuhan. Now, the first one was in uh, 2016, and um, uh, as a result of that presentation, we automatically got the nomination for the next year, so that was progress. Uh, in 2017, he was a runner-up, and so uh, we're, we're, we're not content with second best, so we, uh, we, we, we did it again, and here we are. So this is a project, uh, one of the, a, a project of the a Marsh McLuhan Initiative, and uh, we exist, basically what we, what we do is focus on um, Marsh McLuhan's prairie roots, specifically his Winnipeg upbringing, 
All This Changes We Hear As The Song Goes, uh, and Neil, Neil Young's song, and um, his Catholic faith, which are, are kind of not very well known otherwise. And, and so we want to, that's why we want to focus on that. So there's the house you saw. Oh, enter's good, okay. Um, and the uh, school, one of the, the first schools he went to, which this was located at Confusion Corner, the one he attended, um, the new one, the new one from 1962 is just across the street from the house on Gertrude, but the original Gladstone School, I learned, is at the, at the former Confusion, or the current Confusion Corner. And there's the, uh, his record in the uh, Calvin Technical High School yearbook from 1928, years his graduation. Grade 11 in those days was the uh, high school graduation. His uh, official fo uh, portrait in the brown and gold. And he was a gold medalist. This is um, that one of his quotes um, that expresses very, I think, very well uh, the influence of the West and the prairies on his modus operandi, you might say, uh, from a uh, Danny Finkelman inter inter CBC interview back in 1970. That's not his gold medal, but it would have been one just like that, that he won in arts and science uh, in 1933. And this is, the, this is a really neat um, image that we, we um, was given to us through Richard Altman, I mentioned earlier. A double exposure showing where the Broadway campus of the University of Manitoba would have been located in relation to the, the current cenotaph that's there now. And so that's where those, the, the buildings would have been. And, and some of them the, weren't as, this is a more well-established building. There were a lot of quinoset huts as well in that area. This is one of his early uh, publications. I think you'll see that in the exhibit, yeah. Uh, and his um, treatise from here, George Meredith as a post-traumatic novelist. Uh, this, he won the uh, Governor General's Award in 1962 for this book, uh, nonfiction on the typographic man that, uh, that Michael alluded to earlier. There he, he's, he's come back to, to Winnipeg to receive, and the University of Manitoba to receive his Doctor of uh, Literature degree in 1967. And this was a neat uh, a caricature of many, uh, famous Canadians around that time, and Marshall being one of them, of course. This was a medallion, and this is in the exhibit as well, done by Dorit Bideri Hunt. If you have some change, you know, the poor man's credit card in your pocket, um, anything, any coins issued between 1990 and 2003, if you look at the effigy, uh, her, her niece and executor, uh, Ildiko Hentz, uh, just says that's the one that she really looks like a queen. Well, that was by Dorit Bideri Hunt, yeah, that image. He was an early recipient of the Order of Canada in 1970. Uh, this is that uh, interview uh, was published in this book, uh, an anthology of interviews, and he and his pal Tom Easterbrook were interviewed at the same time by, uh, by uh, um, uh, Danny Finkel Finkelman. And that's the, the uh, piece in, uh, in the book. When a Pigeon's View of Winnipeg, yeah. Then the uh, as who's you know whose images who's which Winnipeggers can you name have a stamp issued in their honor? This is the uh, McLuhan Hall where we had Marsh McLuhan Hall yesterday where we had the official unveiling of the of the bust. This was renamed in 2004, and Eric who was there uh, he's on the far left there. Uh, he quipped when he was uh, giving. Uh, his response that it's the only uh, recognition that he knows of where both his maternal and paternal side were, were recognized at the same time, Marshall McLuhan Hall. Okay, yes, yes, thank you, that's right. And uh, that's a little bit more about that. And then uh, the uh, 
medium and the messaged mural at uh, my former employer, Red River College, in the atrium downtown, the Exchange District campus. And he was uh, uh, nominated as one of the greatest Manitobans and, and appeared in the book by the Winnipeg Free Press. That's more about that. It was done by Morley Walker, formerly retired from the Winnipeg Free Press reporter, arts reporter. And a lot of his, uh, his awards, uh, international awards over the years. Um, then we saw the Newsweek cover. This is really neat, and this was pointed out to us. If you could see <laughs> that, uh, the arrows there, uh, yeah, the nervous system, uh, it sort of looks like Confusion Corner, and it sort of roots, has roots in that, I think. <laughs> Here we have uh, Henry Gibson, Marshall McLuhan, what are you doing? I think I want to see if this, does this work? No, okay. Then the famous, the Playboy interview. I'm surprised you didn't mention that, Michael. <laughs> Play company, maybe. And then we have, um, uh, of course, the, the uh, Annie Hall movie. You'll be getting more, uh, since we've exposed it here again, Michael, you'll be getting more uh, royalties as a result of that. And Wired Magazine. Okay. And this is a cute one here, we, um, the uh, Ballad of Marshall McLuhan at Radio, Radio Free Vestibule. Uh, that's, a, that's a fun one. And the recent uh, uh, biography by Douglas Copeland in the um, series, the Extraordinary Canadian series. And again, who has a, uh, a Google Doodle built dedicated to them? And this is, this is active on the Estates website, if you go to there. And uh, Michael, Michael talked about this, the, the library, um, uh, the collection of his books. There were some 6,000 of them and at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library in Toronto. And I've had the privilege of being there, and it's just amazing uh, what's there and his annotations. You know, you can do, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of graduate students who will be doing treatises on his annotations at some point. And that's not even talking about the official archive in Ottawa. Uh, the, and you saw this. Uh, the, now this is, those of you who were there yesterday, I, I, um, I wanted you to think about uh, our, the evolution of human beings and I think Marshall, you know, he invited us to think and not to just believe but to, to think what, what's going on. Because if we don't, we're going to end up like that last fellow, There's so many people like that bumping into well, maybe they'll die out because they're not paying attention, they'll get run over or something. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what's going to happen if we're not, too, not careful. Go backwards. So this is where, this, this sort of proves the in-betweenness of the, the old spot there in Gertrude, 507 Gertrude between the Red and the Assiniboine Rivers. And um, this is one of his, uh, the, the, we call it the Tetrad. Uh, the tool, you know, being like a microphone, for example, every, every tool, anything you can think of, a chair, a cup, or a paper, any technology you can think of can be analyzed in this way, that it ha extends something of our, our um, capabilities, like the microphone extends our voice, but it also uh, uh, obsolesces something else, like the town crier, for example. Uh, it re maybe retrieves something from the past, like smoke signals uh, over long distances, you know, communicating over long distances. And then it has this odd characteristic of reversing or flipping into its opposite. And as I, as I mentioned yesterday, if you recall the debates of the, uh, the, um, the English language debate of the recent federal election, when everyone was talking over each other, you know, and it was uh, basically a cacophony of sound and fury signifying nothing. And that's what can happen um, with, uh, with technology. So I, yeah, I did an example there. It's fun to do, the, you know, to think of something and then go, 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 go at it. Uh, now these are the, this is I think what Esther, she, um, I did a, um, and, and I followed, Archives and Special Collections, they, they had a wonderful 
exhibit here last year of Robert Reed. He's a typographical designer, a Canadian um, um, a guru in that area, and um, very much uh, very appreciative of Marshall McLuhan's work, whom he, as I would call a man of print, uh, in, uh, after all. And he, he uh, caps, encapsulates these wonderful, in this way, in this visual way, these quotes. And um, Esther, when Esther saw, and I did a display like this that was here, it was, the original one was here, then these were all across Canada and different institutions, and, and um, we did one at Red River College as well. And when Esther saw some of the display there, she came up with, uh, yeah, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah go ahead, yeah. Okay, just I hit enter, over. yeah, just hit enter when you're done, yeah. Okay. I think that Howard did an excellent job the first two years proving that Marshall McLuhan is famous. I think that's a foregone conclusion, but we brought this before the Realtors Association that, oh yes, Marshall McLuhan is from Winnipeg and he's famous. Can we have a bust now? But the Realtors Association. It's more than the Realtors, the selection committee is a cross section of everyone in the community. There, there are Realtors on the selection. So I just want to make people clear, just not Realtors that you're presenting to. There okay. are some past presidents, but do we actually have the Winnipeg Foundation? volunteer associations and law society, doctors. And it's quite a good, I mean, we could be more. Oh, but we have about 18 that serve on the selection. Okay. So, oh, thank you, know, you for that, Peter, yes. Yeah. And, and, and what's interesting over the years, they all, you know, they really have a good discussion. It's not like a, they have, everyone can say it has a bit of a bias, but quite frankly, it was a, you know, a, but it is true what you're saying. You needed to do, I've seen it play out where they really need to somehow tie that individual back to want to take it in an interesting or unique way. And, and, and that's where I think we got it the last time. So thank you for that, Peter. Yes, so we have a, a good cross-section of Winnipeggers looking at, at of Winnipigeons, as Marshall McLuhan would have called them. We have them, we proved, I think, that he's famous, but to, for it to be in the Citizens Hall of Fame, you have to be more than just famous. You have to have done something that, that um, furthers Winnipeg's um, notoriety, notoriety and, uh, and also it, some, some that have done something of benefit for Winnipeg. So that's what we, we thought. I thought, well, we've been doing all this stuff that Marshall McLuhan is famous, all the secondary ma material. Why not? have some primary material to showcase his words, and not only that, but to prove that he's done something useful for, for Winnipeg because his words are still relevant for today. So uh, I put together a few of the posters that, that uh, had been, had been uh, immortalized on these wonderful posters, and so uh, we'll do that now. I'm gonna read every single one of them. Hmm? Okay, so just okay. okay. So th this shows that that um, Marshall McLuhan's works affect everybody. Again, the same thing here. Here's to where where Marshall McLuhan's words kind of have a prophetic note to them. How how. Our technologies can isolate us and prevent us from acting together. Oops, I didn't do that. Just backspace? Yeah. Okay. Time matters. Again, the prophetic words here. Here, he, here, this is, he's, uh, Marshall McLuhan is talking about the fate of the individual with all the technologies. How is the individual or person supposed to survive? Again, now here's his eco ecological footprint here. Violence even in society.
Again, the very prophetic words. And this is t talking how technology is not something to be feared, but it's, it's such an important part of the human experience. Environmental changes, again, he's pr predicting global warming, practically, global climate change. Again, he's talking about the speed of the electronics. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good one, anyway, to read. Once we have surrendered our senses and nervous systems to the private manipulation of those who who would try taking a lease on our eyes, ears, and nerves, we don't have any rights left. Now talk about, talk about prophetic, like yeah. this guy, this, our, it, um, he was amazing in that he predicted so much unrest and the danger of, of an un, unleashed technology. Again, the, the um, to understand our, our, our senses. So I think w the, uh, to sum up, um, one thing I, was, I, I mentioned in, in, the, in our last presentation was that this is even if affecting our children and how Marshall McLuhan's words can help us get, bring back the fine art of conversation and perhaps the dinner table. Just, just like the McLuhan's. <laughs> just like the McLuhan's got dressed up for every night. And here's the slat. I don't know if, any, if you've seen this at, at the Austin Street, Street Bridge where Marshall would walk from 507 Gertrude over to the Broadway Street campus. And this, of course, this, this is the new bridge. This wasn't there when he was there, but, but he walked the, across that, uh, that area. And Marshall McLuhan lived here. And that's the name of our, our, uh, our documentary video that's coming right up by Jared Cole, and, he, and Jared took the picture, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, photograph, and then at, at nighttime it lights up. And uh, this is a, a quote by Richard Altman, the seer of the global village grew up in Osborne Village. So there you are. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I initially shot this footage for a filmmaking class at the University of Winnipeg in April of 2017 and made a five minute cut to submit uh, for the requirements of the assignment and always intended to revisit it and extend it. Of course, uh, video production and editing takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and sometimes a lot of money. And I haven't really had the time to, to get back to the footage, but uh, Howard sent me a message in August or September and, and invited me to, to present here. And uh, I thought, well, it gave me the motivation to, to try to finish this with the footage that was available that I had on hand uh, to the best of my ability and um, to, to more accurately represent the vision that I had while I was uh, doing the filming. And it was made on a budget, and thank, thankfully, uh, due to being a student at the time, uh, some of the fees for shooting at the various universities were, were waived. Uh, my travels took me to Edmonton. I had a grander scale uh, initially. Marshall McLuhan lived here, meaning Canada, so I wanted to go to Edmonton, I wanted to film in Winnipeg, and I wanted to film in Toronto. Uh, of course, there was no funding to go to Toronto, so there's no real Toronto footage in this. And because this is a celebration of the Winnipeg roots of Marshall McLuhan and uh, recognition of him being a Winnipegian, I, my focus was to, to bring out the Winnipeg roots and the Winnipeg content in uh, the footage that I had on hand. And so nobody has ever seen this before. I finished it maybe two weeks ago. Uh, it's about 23 minutes, and uh, it stars Howard Engel. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for, for coming out today. Uh, Marshall McLuhan lived here. Mm. 
Well, thank you. I guess I could take some quick questions if there is any, and then we'll carry on. There's no questions. I'll just say that, uh, you know, I think that Winnipeg stands as one of the most important places in the world right now because it is the best place to read Marshall McLuhan and therefore understand him. And Marshall McLuhan is, you know, one of the most famous Canadians of all time. But today, to, to, to an environment of a global village, uh, which is the best description of our contemporary global society, um, you need to understand media because it is your human created environment. Our environment is, exists of a totality of our extensions and the feedback, uh, you know, the call for more feed forward, the subtitle of War and Peace in the Global Village. <clears throat> we need more feed forward, we need less feedback because we are gonna write ourselves out of existence and through writing, you know, which led to print, which led to electronic uh, information media of the 20th century and the digital revolution of the 21st century. Uh, it's a critical time for our species to understand our extensions, finally. So I invite the world to Winnipeg to study Marshall McLuhan. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Howard, uh, so now we're coming to the presentation of the Medium and the Light Award. Yes, the moment we've all been waiting for, because as you know, this is kept under wraps till now. And just to give you a little background to this award, it's one of our, one of the initiatives of the initiative, if you will, or projects. And um, it is, it's a, a, um, inspi inspired by the book, uh, The Medium and the Light. It was published in 1999. It's a, uh, anthology of uh, McLuhan's thoughts on on religion and um, and its effects or actually the effects of technology on um, on on religion and 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 the human being in general and our spiritual life so it was first unveiled in 2011 and it uh, conceived, was conceived by my late colleague, Richard, J., Richard Jan Osiki. And it's given to a person, group, or organization that has made a significant contribution to religious and or ecumenical communication inspired by observations and notions put forward by Marshall McLuhan. And there's Richard, and that's actually the, at the, the, the occasion of the first Medium and Light Award in 2011 at uh, St. Mike's College. And this was the first recipient, uh, the late uh, Father Pierre Bedin Oamai, Order of the Mich Missionary uh, Oblates, uh, in his home in his um, uh, home in, in Lyon, France. And that's uh, some of you may know who that the Dr. Dominique Sheffield Doran at the time she was. That's actually her hometown, and she happened to be going there. He was too um, infirm to travel. To Toronto. That was in the centenary year of, Mar of McLuhan's um, birth, and so she was very gracious and offered to when she learned, you know, that he we, we learned that he was living there in the same city, that she would actually present it on behalf of the initiative. So that took place, and that that's one of his major works there, uh, Autre Homme, Autre Chrétien, L'Age Electronique. I believe that was translated into English and other languages as well. And that's what it looks like. That's the award, uh, Obelesque. And uh, Richard dubbed it a tetrad after that tool, probing tool that I referred to earlier. 2012, we presented it to uh, Dr. Um, Thomas Cooper, Emerson College, who actually collaborated with McLuhan as a grad student in the 70s. And he took forward, he was one of, um, one of the scholars that took forward McLuhan's um, ideas with a lot of enthusiasm in future in his career. And of course, uh, our beloved late Eric McLuhan was the uh, recipient in the, uh, 2013. And um, that was at the Coach House. You've heard about the Coach House. That's actually at the Coach House. And that was the 50th anniversary of the Coach House's opening. And the Coach House is famous for its um, being the site of the 
the, the, the Monday night seminars that the marshal would host and he would bring in guest speakers and so on and people would gather around him like this is I guess this is where he got the term guru because the people were all around sitting on the floor and everything it was it's pretty cramped it's just it's a small space and you'd have these often famous scholars and and personages of the time including our own Prime Minister Trudeau at one point and uh, just, ex just exchange ideas and, 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 and uh, um, in, 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 a, in a spirit of conviviality and cigar smoke. And that's the, that award that year, that's the actual award that, presented, that was presented to Eric. And uh, the next year it was Father John Jane Pungenti, who actually happens to be my, when I was a, a student at uh, St. Paul's High School here in Winnipeg, Father Pungenti was my principal. And um, he, and he went on to found the, in 1984, the um, um, uh, Jesuit Communication Project in Toronto. And so this was the first year we presented an award to not only an individual, but to an organization for their work. Um, oh, I, should, I just wanted to point out something in that previous slide. That McLuhan, that sign in the background, you can see that, that's the coach house right there. And this is, we're on the grounds of St. Regis College, which sort of backs on to the, uh, the coach house, and that's where that is. The next year, uh, we presented it to um, Richard uh, posthumously, so that was our first posthumous, um, and probably our, going to be our only posthumous uh, uh, recognition of the award, just for his, his vision. And um, up to that point, he and I had actually selected the recipients, so even, in, you know, he, he had a hand in uh, Eric's and also in Father Pingenti's uh, nomination. And uh, the award, as it looked in 2015, the one that we presented to the family in 2015, I should maybe mention uh, um, Diana Sia's his widow, Toby uh, is his son, and George, his brother. Yeah, and that's at St. Paul's College. That was at that conference uh, that, that uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier. And, uh, so in 2016 at the Toronto then now next conference, Toronto School of Communication, um, we presented it to Sister uh, Angela Ann Zukowski, who was a mentor to Richard. And uh, when he was a grad student at the University of Dayton in Ohio. And um, this is my uh, colleague um, Ruthann Rubel, uh, who's a, a very um, passionate scholar of McLuhan and Leonard Cohen and biblical studies. So, and she ties all those in in her papers that she's presented for many years. She's a uh, retired uh, high school teacher. Um, Havergal was her was where she taught the private uh, girls' school in Toronto. And this is, in, of course, in Toronto. And that's what the award looked like in uh, 2016. So it's a little different. Each year it's a little different. The colors are a little different, and I'll get into that a little bit in terms of the composition of the, of the award itself. Um, but it's, it's really a work of art. Um, and here, I, here we are in, uh, at St. Mary's College of California in 2017 with um, Paul Sukup, who's the SJ, who was the recipient that year. He's a, a longtime media ecologist and uh, secretary of MEA, and he, he collaborated with Thomas Farrell on the work of uh, Walter Ong, SJ, who talked about uh, orality, and, and, uh, and um, Walter Ong, by the way, was a, uh, uh, a grad student at St. Louis University, and Marshall was his uh, advisor. So that's the award from 2017, how it, what it looked like. So this year we took a sabbatical, <laughs> no, no Medium and Light Award in 2018. But here's the, the gentleman that uh, creates it by hand each year at uh, Prairie Studio Glass, uh, Matthew McMillan. Uh, those of you who have any connection to Prairie Studio Glass would probably know or have met Matthew, but he's uh, uh, an artist in his own right. And he and, and Richard collaborated on creating the award as an objet d'art to give out each year or almost every year. So in, in um, honor of Marshall's engineering background, this is what the award is, uh, consists of, crystal clear soda glass, 
It's actually not very light. It's called the medium and light award, but it's, it's pretty hefty. And uh, it embeds a piece of opalescent uh, diacroic glass. It looks like a piece of metal, actually. And the logo is etched on that. Uh, um, it has a multi-metal coating, as you can see there. It refracts, it refracts in many colors. So this is sort of the idea of, of uh, the medium and the light. This is in, in reflecting and thinking, as Marshall invites us to do. Um, uh, diversity of light is, is shown and is, and, is, and is cast out. Um, and then the, in the, on the award, both the recipient's names and, uh, are etched, as you can see, horizontally on the obelisk surface. So now we come to this year. So you could see this is the actual award for this year. There's 2019 etched on the, on the obelisk. And we, I'm going to have, this is going to be a little bit of fun here. So here's some clues who this person is. Uh, this person is a veteran broadcaster. OK, you can read that. And uh, oh, yeah. So uh, any guesses who this might be? Pardon? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> oh, you're so smart. OK, let's, yeah, there's more. Well, you guessed it. Give up? No, you didn't give up. No, you didn't give up. There she is. So, um, Esther, if you want to unveil it for me, for us. So it is, it is indeed Rosanna, your child. Where is she? Is she here? <laughs> there she is. This is heavy, gosh. I'm dropping on my toe here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, incredible, incredible honor. Um, I'm honored to accept this on behalf of my team at Unreserved, um, Anna Lazowski, Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, and Zoe Tennant, who are right now not able to attend because they're hard at work making radio magic. Uh, while I get to do fun stuff, they get to slave away. Um, a shout out of love also to my good friend Kim Wheeler here. She's been my uh, supporter uh, in my crazy journey in many ways. Um, the message is the medium. I remember hearing that 25 years ago in journalism school at uh, Red River College. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, of course, as you know, coined that expression, the term global village, and uh, predicted the world wide web almost 30 years before it was invented. Who knew, right? They were like, you're crazy. Sit down, crazy man. But no, oh, here we are. Um, in the two decades that I have uh, worked in the media industry alone, we have seen incredible shifts and changes uh, in what we communicate and how we communicate. From newspapers to news apps, local news to World Wide Web, uh, water cooler conversations to social media. But what continues to bind us together, whether a community, a nation, or a country, is story. The stories that we tell each other teach us about who we are, what our values are, and what our goals will be. As many great storytellers will tell you, including the great Thomas King and the late Richard Wagamese, story is all that we are. Unreserved strives to tell stories about the Indigenous experience uh, here in this place we currently call Canada. Uh, in the five years since we became a national radio program on CBC, something that has not happened in 30 years since the uh, age of Bernalda Wheeler and our native land, 
Uh, ironically, Kim is married to uh, Bernalda's son, so we have a small world going on here. Um, we have shared community culture and conversation. Uh, we have contributed to the national discourse um, on everything, uh, including residential schools, to cultural reclamation, history to history making, and um, ultimately have helped lead this country down the path of reconciliation. Um, I hope that we would continue to do so for many more years. Um, and it is, again, my great honor to be a small piece of it. And uh, on behalf of my team, thank you very much. We've always wanted to associate the award with some kind of a, a, a prize, uh, financial. And uh, this year, thanks to the Engel Family Fund at the Winnipeg Foundation, we were able to do that. So on behalf of my family at the, and the Winnipeg Foundation, congratulations again, Rosanna, on, on uh, um, uh, being uh, a most worthy recipient of the award. And we're very proud and humbled to be able to also um, share with you um, a token of our appreciation in your, in your work. So keep up the great work. It was the soft launch of the McLuhan Faith and Works Conference Proceedings Book of a Certain Winnipegian and Religion, McLuhan's Faith and Works Conference Proceedings. Sorry. That's okay. Thanks. So as I mentioned earlier, in 2015, uh, St. Paul's College hosted this conference that was a collaboration between the um, McLuhan Initiative, Marsh McLuhan Initiative, which at that time was affiliated with St. Paul's College, we are no longer, and also uh, the International Institute for the Study of um, Technology and Christianity, at, uh, which is based out of uh, uh, Wheaton College in Illinois. And uh, I mentioned that Reed, Reed Schuchart uh, is the um, senior, um, uh, it's a senior, he calls himself the senior director, and he was the guy that proposed the idea in the first place. And I might mention, I say soft launch, it's maybe more accurately termed a virtual launch. I have no physical book to show you, unfortunately, yet, but we're getting there. Uh, but I thought I would take this opportunity to at least give you a progress report on it. So this was the, it, the, the, the conference it's based on. Um, that was the call for papers. And then we had the um, McLuhan Galaxy blog, which is the official blog of the McLuhan estate, headed up by Michael, none other than Michael McLuhan, um, and uh, uh, advertised this for, uh, on their blog as they're advertising the symposium for us as well. That's the, um, the, the program, and there's a, with a special logo associated with it. And as you might expect, um, the chapters of the book are represented uh, and they're actually going to be in order of, of appearance uh, in the program, being proceedings after all, sort of mirrors what actually happened, um, the, the table of contents essentially. So we have the keynote address by Eric McLuhan, for example, is the first one, and so on. And, and we, we were very proud to be able to feature some really uh, top-notch McLuhan scholars like Andrew Crystal, who was mentioned before, Dennis Linka, who is retired from this university um, uh, in the Faculty of Education. Dennis Calley from uh, Texas, Eric McLuhan. Himself, Leo, uh, Father Leo Riley, Reed Chukart, Ruth Ann Rubel, Thomas Farrell, and, and others. And, uh, and we also have, uh, in addition to established scholars, we have up and coming ones like Andrew McLuhan, Brantley Milligan, Danny Heinemann, jo Jonas Cornel Cornelson, who actually uh, graduated from our uh, Canadian Mennonite University, and Paul Vermeesh, and Richard, none other than Richard Altman, who is here um, for, for his video. Uh, so I just want to give you a little peek, at least into what the book is going to look like. So we have the foreword by Eric McLuhan. And not only did he give us a foreword, he actually, he's the real editor. He took all the papers and standardized their scholarly, present, their academic presentation, being the generous person he was and scholar he was. So um, 
and, we're, and, and that's how it's going to appear. So this is his, his paper, of chapter one. And um, just to show you a few others, and Ruth Ann's contribution, uh, Tales with Teeth, reversing Daniel's Den with Marsha McCullen, and um, Reed's um, contribution, Hiding in Plain Sight, How Marsha McCullen's vocation, inform vocation informed his vocation, and vice versa. And the uh, explanation of the logo as well. Uh, Man the Manitoba McLuhan, and I, just a word on this one from Dennis Linka. Uh, it, was, it was a bit of a mystery to the family, uh, to the, uh, like Marshall's children, in particular Eric and then Andrew. Uh, why, you know, what did his, the, their ancestors see in Winnipeg? You know, they kind of, because it's not exactly the boom town it once was. Well, that's the point. Uh, if, you, if you look at the history of, of Winnipeg from that period, um, 18, from roughly early 1880s through um, the beginning of World War I, and well, more, and more to the point, the Isthmus of, or the Panama Can Canal, Winnipeg was a boom town, was touted to be becoming the Chicago of the North. It was the intersection of the vaudeville circuit, if you can believe that. All of the, the fame, Charlie Chaplin, Angels and all the famous vaudeville acts that came, came. Winnipeg was an experimental site for all these acts. acts. So what better place than an elocutionist who wants to you know, make herself better known, rather than go to Edmonton, who has ever heard of Edmonton out in the boonies, you know, the, northern, the, 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 the so far north and out of the way, coming to Winnipeg, the center of North America at the time. So that's where, and Dennis really did a, a fine job of pointing that out in his paper. Uh, oh yes, everyone likes Raymond. Um, uh, yeah, that's the um, um, uh, little joke we have when we when we came up with this idea. We were eating Raymond noodles, and uh, you know, came up with the idea to have this conference. And uh, I wanted to do an ode to my friend Richard Osicki, and I I was expecting to have my computer up and running to do that. Uh, I'll just do a very brief beginning of it here. This is uh, part of the eulogy that I gave him. Uh, he died on October 29, 2012 of throat cancer. And um, uh, rather ironically too, because he was a journalist and broadcaster himself. And um, he, uh, and, and his, his, his uh, the prayers before his funeral was on November the 6th at St. Patel Parish on Pemina Highway, just north of here. So I'll just begin, you know, in, in I, I was hoping to read the whole thing, but anyway, I'll just read this part. Two minds searching for meaning in our hyper-mediated world, independently finding it in McLuhan's, the medium is the message. Two men brought together by the Renaissance about us, a keynote address by McLuhan's son, Eric a renaissance, a rebirth of understanding, an extension of love like two hands reaching out in the midst of the media vortex. We clasped each other celebrating ideas, faith and life these past five and a half years. And so it goes. The book itself will feature the following. Uh, it's gonna be published by freesandpress.com there's 100% participation by all the presenters. Um, so there's some 30 papers altogether, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's gonna be about 400 pages. <laughs> and uh, there's, it's gonna be complete with footnotes, but bibliography and index to extend the, the scholarship and research that was well begun, or even in many instances continued by the, the various authors. Uh, full color images throughout, including portraits of most of the speakers. Uh, it's going to be in three formats, hardcover, softcover, and ebook. And the estimated cost, given that it's not a huge, well, we're probably going to do print on demand, actually, rather than a short print run, but we'll see. But that's sort of the, the, the ballpark estimate of cost at this point. 99 for hardcovers, 40 and half that for softcover and, um, and uh, ebook. E um, of course, there's added shipping and handling for the hard copies. 
and there's going to be appendices um, and uh, the accomplishments accomplishments of the McLuhan Initiative to date uh, since its inception in 2007 and plus that ode I began quoting from and uh, if you're interested Shelley you had a chance to print they're good they're, they're, they're here on this table I would invite you to feel free to uh, give your name address phone number and email and which which uh, version you might be interested in and I really appreciate that thank you so much so um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here. Um, we really appreciated you coming out. And a uh, hearty thank you to Michael, and he's going to say something. I am, because <laughs> I haven't even been invited up here. But um, I, I personally did want to thank uh, both uh, Shelley Sweeney on behalf of my wife and myself, and of course, Howard Engel and uh, Esther Juice uh, for having us here. It's been great. I've been to Winnipeg, uh, I think, once before as a photographer teaching at our national convention when it was here. I can't remember when, but I didn't get out of the hotel much except to see 507 Gertrude. And uh, I'd just like to notice this isn't a big uh, omission on Winnipeg's part. The people that own the house don't want to have anything to do with an historical plaque. So that's why one was never put up. At least that's what I was told uh, back at... Um, well, <laughs> you know... They rented everywhere. I mean, it wasn't uh, a big deal. And there are enough plaques. There are enough plaques. Not around here. I'm you know, you spent your life removing plaque. I mean, you know, there's, uh, it, it's, you can only do so much with plaque. But thank you so much for having us. We love this woman. <laughs> thank this you. guy's okay, but I'm going to have a